We're going to start into a session with uh, how other regions do it. And uh, we're going to have a look at through, through that prism. And it is a great privilege, again, to have a, another unique uh, and, and experienced speaker with us. We have Dr. Dermot Scully, who is an academic advisor to Limerick, if the, who was the academic advisor to the Limerick Implementation Advisor Group, and indeed a former uh, mayor of Limerick. Um, it's a real privilege to have him with us this afternoon. He's uh, one of the eminent people in this field. Uh, we, we're going to learn an awful lot from over the next 15 minutes from the presentation, indeed some of the Q&A we'll have with uh, Dr. Scully. So it gives me a great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. Dermot Scully. Oh. Thank you very much, and, uh, and thank you very much, uh, Jim, t uh, Chairman. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to live up to that introduction, but, uh, but it was very nice of you to say it anyway. Um, you've got an awful lot of detailed information so far today, uh, and I'm going to be throwing a bit more at you, but what I want you to do over the next 15 minutes is just take a, a sort of a step back and a broader view, because uh, one of the messages I want you to leave with here today is that our system of local government is not the norm. It is very much an outlier. It's unlike anything that exists anywhere else in Europe. Uh, in fact, it is the weakest, most underfunded uh, system of local government uh, and the, the one with the least powers and the least authority of any of the countries in Europe, or almost any. We're going to look at that in a little more detail. Uh, I want you to take a look at this map, first of all, because this is a map. Uh, it's an old map. Uh, it's a couple of months out of date because Russia has been expelled from this organization, so you can actually take them off uh, the chart. I left it in there because the information I'm going to share with you uh, dates from when Russia was still a member. But this is the Council of Europe, not to be confused with the EU, but often when we talk of Europe, we talk of 27 countries. There are actually 48 countries in Europe. And all 48, or most of them anyway, Belarus and Kazakhstan being the, the previous exceptions, and now Russia, uh, are members of the Council of Europe. It's primarily a human rights organization founded uh, after the Second World War, uh, to promote democracy and human rights in Europe, and it's best known for the European Court of Human Rights, which is based in Strasbourg. Again, a lot of people think that's an EU institution. It's not. It's an institution of the Council of Europe. You're going to be hearing a lot more about this over the next six months because Ireland has just taken over the chair uh, from Italy in Turin last night. So Simon Coveney is now actually the chair of the Council of Europe, or at least the chair of the, the ministers in the Council of Europe, and will be for the next six months. You may wonder, what has any of this got to do with local government? Actually, an awful lot. The Council of Europe are the organization behind the European Charter of Local Self-Government. Why is a human rights organization promoting local government? Because local government, effective local government, effective local democracy is one of the strongest protections against tyranny. If you allow local people to make decisions about their lives in their own local communities, you enhance democracy, you enhance freedom, you enhance human rights, you enhance all of these things. So they've been pushing uh, a set of principles. There are 30 in all. The link is there to it. I'm not going to go through them, but it's only a six-page document. You're going to get a copy of this presentation afterwards. I encourage you to click on the link, read through it. Six pages, 30 principles, very short and sweet. Uh, first laid down in 1988, um, Ireland didn't ratify it until 2002. Now, the Council of Europe has no teeth. They've no power to enforce uh, the, the, the charter, but they do do periodic reports, and they publish them. The last one done in Ireland was in 2013. And of the 30 principles, lay down in the charter that we signed in 2002, so 11 years beforehand, we were found to be in breach of 22 of them. To put that in context, Putin's Russia, which was still a member, was found to be in breach of seven. In other words, a local authority in Ireland has less autonomy, less authority, and less power than a local, autonomy in Putin's, a local authority in Putin's Russia. And that's the message I really want to get across to you. Our system is not actually normal. Of the 44 countries that signed the Charter, because not all 47 that were in uh, the Council of Europe signed the Charter, but 44 did, Ireland was ranked 43rd. Uh, the only one to score worse than us was Moldova. Uh, of the 27 countries in the European Union, obviously, we come last. Last in terms of powers, last in terms of functions, last in terms of funding, last in terms of absolutely everything. Um, the 2013 report, which is the most recent one we had, pulled out various things uh, that, that need to be addressed. Uh, they said the lack of involvement of local authorities in education, in healthcare, in public transport, the fact that there was no statutory input into policing, uh, were things that are normally done elsewhere, but aren't done here. The idea that Dublin City Council, or the four Dublin authorities together, don't run the bus service in Dublin is quite amazing. And again, would not happen in any other capital city in Europe. 
it is very, very unusual. And this is the message I want to get across. We have a highly centralized system of financing. This is in my words, this is the report from the Council of Europe uh, that allows for limited discretion to local authorities to determine service levels. You have a relatively weak mayor. In fact, they, I think they pulled their punch on that one uh, in relation to the power of what was then called the city manager, now called the chief executive. Uh, the fact that at the time, uh, they said councillors aren't being paid enough. You've heard that again this morning. Uh, limited participation for women. This is something we have actually improved a little bit on, uh, but at the time only 16% of councillors were women. Uh, very few young people, very few wage earners. And the last one, the impossibility of removing the county or city manager. In theory, the, the chief executives report to the council. Councils actually have to pass a vote to formally accept their chief executive, even though they have no role in picking them. And if they decide to vote against uh, accepting them, the minister will simply impose the chief executive anyway. But they go through the charade of accepting a chief executive because, in theory, the chief executive reports to the council and works for the council. In reality, they don't. In most other countries, they do. The council can hire the chief executive. The council can fire the chief executive. That's assuming, of course, that the chief executive isn't the mayor, which in many cases they are. Now, in case you're thinking, oh, well, that was 2013. I'm sure everything's changed. Uh, Dr. Mary Murphy... Uh, did a study in 2019 for the Forza Trade Union uh, on local government across Europe. And she found that Ireland came 27 out of the 27 countries in terms of powers, in terms of functions, and in terms of funding. Again, there's a link uh, to Mary's report there. Uh, the two charts that I put up there aren't from her report, actually. They're from the, the one I did for the, the Limerick uh, directly elected mayors, and you've got a link again to that if you want to take a read of it. Again, it's very short, so that's the main thing. But the one on the left is just to point out something that, again, most people don't really, really realise. We have the fewest councillors per head of population in Europe. We have far fewer elected representatives at local level than the rest of Europe. We have more at national level proportionately than most of the countries in Europe, but we have by far the fewest at local level. And the one on the right-hand side as you're looking at it is just a modelling of systems from the ones that give the most power to the elected mayor and the ones that give the least power. And you'll notice that in each of them, the, the strong mayor model has many countries involved in it, the committee level model, the collective model. There's only one country in Europe that uses the council manager model, and that's us. It used to be called the British model, except the British don't use it anymore. Well, they do use it in Scotland, and I'd get into trouble if I say the British use it in Northern Ireland. That could lead to all sorts of uh, disputes as exactly what the term means. So it's used in Scotland, it's used in Northern Ireland, it's used here, and that's it. So we've grown up thinking that this is the norm, that this is the way things work. It isn't. It's not the norm, it's not the way things work. And it doesn't have to be this way. In terms of the amount to spend at local level in Ireland, it's less than 2%. You go to Denmark and you'll find that's about 70% of total government expenditures at the local level providing services in localities. Here it's about 1.2% is directly spent at the local level. Now, a lot more money is spent in local areas, but it's coming down directly from government and it's dictated by central government. Now, in places like Limerick, when we were talking about this, we're always talking about let's take power away from Dublin, let's bring it back to Limerick. In reality, what you're talking about here is let's take power to Dublin and let's take it away from certain people in certain offices in Dublin that hold that power, but don't hold it on behalf of the people of Dublin. Uh, I know, realize I'm nearly getting, I'm going to be told you, you're advocating here. Don't advocate, <laughs> just give the facts. But to recap, these are facts. Ireland has the weakest local government in the EU the most wonderful funded local government in the EU, the fewest councillors in the EU, and the weakest mayors in the EU. And a question I'd ask, and I'm not going to suggest what the answer is, but is there a connection between all of these things? Is there some linkage? So how do other countries do it? Well, the reality is there are many, many different systems, and you could spend the rest of your lives studying the systems, and we've only got you for a few months, so we'll give a very, very quick overview, and I know Sean Riordan is going to give a much a more in-depth one on a couple of examples later. But essentially, there are three major ones. Well, there's four. There are directly elected executive mayors. There are council-elected executive mayors, where the council has the power and chooses the mayor, but the mayor is still the executive. You have the council manager system, whereby the council is a check on the manager, and the manager is the executive. Call the chief executive here. And then there are hybrid systems, which are a bit of a mixture of all of them. And I suppose one question would be, you know, wouldn't it be great if somebody had actually run an experiment, see which one of these works best? And the good news is somebody did. They had to go through an awful lot in order to run it, uh, but post-war Germany effectively did do this experiment uh, because this was post-war Germany. It was an occupied country occupied by the four Allied powers. Now, the, the pre prologue to this is that Adolf Hitler destroyed local democracy in Germany. Again, local democracy is a bulwark against tyranny, uh, so tyrants like to get rid of it. Uh, he purged any mayors that weren't members of the Nazi party, he purged any... Uh, body in senior executive positions and council weren't members of the Nazi party, and the local Nazi Gauleiter 
became the head of the local administration. Sometimes the Gauleiter went to the bother of appointing themselves mayor. Sometimes they didn't. Sometimes they liked the chains, and others couldn't be bothered. Uh, but essentially, when the Allies came in, they found they couldn't continue using the system of local government that was already there, so they needed to bring in a new one. And what happened was each of the occupying powers introduced their own system in their own region. So in the south of Germany, in Bavaria, in the south, uh, the American system uh, area, they introduced directly elected mayors. In the French zone, they introduced council elected executive mayors. And in the north, they introduced the British system, council manager system, our system. Uh, in the east, they went with something very similar to the Nazi system, just replacing the Gauleiter with the general secretary of the Communist Party. Uh, and it remained like that up until the fall of the Berlin Wall. And then after the fall of the Berlin Wall, the cities and counties in eastern Germany said, look, we need a new system of local government. What are we going to adopt? We clearly can't continue using the one we've had. So they went looking for a new one. Uh, every major town and city in what used to be East Germany went with the US system, the directly elected mayor with executive powers. Now, part of the reason for that was because Bavaria, and this probably has got nothing to do with system of local government, it's just a coincidence, that Bavaria went from being the poorest part of Germany in 1945 to being the richest in 1990, so it was seen to be a success. But there were other arguments for it as well. Uh, and essentially, they decided to go for it. Now, that led to a certain amount of soul searching in the former French and British zones, where they went, well, hang on, why are we using the system of local government that was imposed on us by the Allied powers when Eastern Germany decided to go with this one. And over the next decade, almost every city in Germany switched to directly elected mayors uh, with executive powers. In some places, they introduced uh, council chairs that were separately elected and chaired the council separate to the mayor to act as a check and balance. Uh, and in some places, they also introduced recall referendums, whereby a mayor's decision could be overturned by the public. Those checks and balances, one or other, and in many cases both, were put in place everywhere because you do have to have some forms of checks and balances on it. And Germany, with history, was particularly conscious of the danger of electing the wrong person because they knew what had happened uh, when that was done before. Uh, as of now, 76% of Germans live in cities or rural regions that are governed by a directly elected mayor, almost all the cities. Uh, nobody in Germany lives under a council manager system. Flensburg was the last one, and they switched over in 1999. So they completely abandoned the British system, decided that wasn't working. Some places have kept the French system. And Berlin, quite uniquely, is a city and a state. So Berlin actually has a parliament, has a minister pre president that runs the, uh, the state, and it goes by the title mayor of Berlin. So the mayor of Berlin isn't really a mayor, they're a state leader. Um, so what sort of things came up uh, in Germany? Well, the main thing, given their history, is that there were obvious concerns about introducing elected, elected mayors throughout the country. Uh, there were worries about the quantity, quality of the candidates, the nature of them. Uh, would the person be able to do the job? Would it be a danger of uh, electing extremists? Well, to date, no extremist has ever been elected as a mayor in Germany. It's never happened. They've been electing mayors in southern Germany for 70 years and have not yet elected somebody who would be regarded as an extremist. And the Germans have very strong and clear ideas about who's regarded as an extremist. Uh, in 20 plus years since the adoption of directly elected mayors nationwide, since roughly the turn of the century when the, the, the last uh, council uh, manager uh, system was brought to an end, uh, the quality of the directly elected mayors elected has improved steadily. You're tending to get people elected with stronger educational background, with more experience, uh, candidates of objectively higher quality uh, across the board. And the systems of checks and balances has worked. Independent council chairs are the norm, which are occasionally the added on uh, power of the referendum. The other thing that the Germans kept was professional management below the level of the mayor. So the mayor is the chief executive, the mayor makes the decisions, but those decisions are implemented by full-time public servants who are professional managers. And that system uh, seems to work for them. Now, so far everything I've given you is what I gave to the, uh, the people in Limerick. But Limerick was a much easier one to decide on because it's one council. The recommendation that's gone to government is very simple. Uh, we put the mayor in where the chief executive now is and give them the powers of the chief executive. And by the way, we've got a list of additional powers we'd like you to devolve from central government. There wasn't the issue of, have you got four authorities? What are you going to do with them? Are you going to amend them? Are you going to, to do them in different ways? And I know this is what Sean is going to be talking about in a few moments. But again, I want you to think about this because you have got effectively a blank slate. If you were arguing about the boundary between Limerick and Clare, and believe me, I've had that argument, uh, people get very, very hot up very quickly and get very angry very quickly. I suspect the boundary between Fingal and Dublin City Council isn't quite as fraught an issue. Maybe I'm wrong there, but I, I don't think it's, it's, it's as deeply held. I think when you've got one Gaelic football team led by one great manager, um, you, you know, it tends to bring people together uh, in a way because the, the rows between Limerick and Clare always came down to hurling, uh, inevitably. 
Uh, so the sort of options that are available. In New York in 1898, New York was five cities, the five boroughs. You had a separate mayor for Brooklyn, the Bronx, Manhattan, Staten Island, uh, and Queens, and separate city councils. They decided to merge them all into one. Created one council, one mayor, executive mayor, directly elected with powers, council separately elected, independent chair, to act as a check and balance on them, pass the budgets, et cetera, et cetera. That's one way of doing it. It's very effective, it worked. It wouldn't be the norm in Europe because we would say, hang on, that's seven million people, and you've got one council over them, you need something more at local level, and they don't have that. London, which is a similarly sized city, went with a different approach. I'm using English language examples now because I know not everybody speaks German, and I certainly don't, um, but it, it's easier for you to, to, to look it up if you want to, to check these things out yourself. Uh, in London, they decided to leave the 32 authorities in place. So there are 32 councils in London, 32 mayors. 32 chief executives, one of whom is called the Lord Mayor of London, who rides around the golden coach and has the big chains uh, and presides over the Lord Mayor's banquet, and it's changed every year. And then they have a directly elected executive mayor, who's just called the mayor, not the Lord Mayor, doesn't have robes or chains, but has specific authority over specific areas. So they were given policing, they were given public transport, given tourism, given environmental policy, various ones. A separate London Assembly elected to act as a check and balance on the mayor and to approve the budget, uh, and you put this overarching structure in but the original authorities still exist, and they still have power and control over the areas that they always have power and control over. It's potentially another mod model. A third approach is similar to what they've done in Auckland and New Zealand. In Auckland, they abolished the 11 existing councils. They merged them all into one, single council. 20 councillors elected. So I'm saying very few councillors, good God. 20 councillors. Auckland is a city of one and a half million people. New Zealand's a country of five million. It's very similar to the relationship between Dublin and the rest of Ireland. And within Auckland City Council, which is both a city and a region, there is a large rural area. So how do we handle this? Surely the people in the city are just going to outvote the rural areas. So what they did is, each councillor is elected, and they're elected in single seat constituency, so it's easier to do under that system. Each councillor was made the chair of their own local board. There are separate elections to elect nine people to each of the local boards. So you have 180 local councillors just looking after the local board area. They're one of the 20 constituencies. Then you have 20 higher level councillors, if you like, who form uh, the overall council, uh, and that is chaired by a directly elected mayor. The reason I'm giving you these three very different examples, they're all attempts to solve this problem of how do we bring a disparate region, not, in the case of not even a disparate region, how do we bring an, a large area, how do we govern it? And the reality is you can do it whatever way you like. There isn't a right or wrong answer, uh, and I know whatever decision you, you recommend is going to have real world uh, consequences, so you'd like there to be a right or wrong answer, and I'd love there to be a right or wrong answer. All these options are available and all these options are open. And it's a matter of trying to weigh them as to which you think is going to work best. Now, the crucial difference in London and Auckland is that in Auckland, the power rests with the centre, it rests with the 20 councillors. And the local boards have devolved powers from there. In London, much of the power still rests with the 32 councils. And the overarching just deals with the issues that are separate to that. So it's a different approach. Um, now, I'm going to finish just by showing you these two people. Uh, the first is uh, Fiorella LaGuardia, three times elected mayor of New York. Uh, and it's an independent mayor of New York, three times. Uh, LaGuardia Airport is named after him. And because he was the most successful independent in America, he was approached to see what he wanted to run for president. You know, break up the duopoly of the Republicans and Democrats. And he famously said, who wants to be president when you can be mayor of New York? Because as mayor of New York, as the executive of a city of seven million people, he controlled the police force, the fire department, you name it education, schools, health services, the whole lot, had immense executive power and could deliver for his constituents who were mostly uh, the Italian Amer American community. The other person I want to point out to you is Phil Goff. Phil is the mayor of Auckland. Now, he's not an executive mayor. He's a directly elected head of what is effectively a council manager system, it's the old British system, with one very, very important difference. The council in Auckland hires and fires the chief executive. Chief executives serve a contract of three years, with a possible extension of two more to five, and their decision on whether to hire them in the first place or whether to fire them in the meantime is carried out entirely by the council. That gives the council very considerable powers over the chief executive, who is the accounting officer and who does report to them and retains the power within there. Now, the reason I'm pointing out Phil Goff, we had four very excellent mayors here, and I'm sure anyone would be delighted to have any of them uh, elected uh, as the mayor of, of a, a united Dublin authority. But the likelihood is that it won't be one of these, it'll be somebody of a very different calibre. Because the directly elected representative of one and a half million people, or whatever roughly is the population uh, of Dublin City and County Council, area, the city and county, is going to be probably the foremost political position in the country. 
arguably more powerful than the Taoiseach. Now, Phil Goff, when he decided to run for mayor of Auckland, was the leader of the opposition. His successor in that role was Jacinda Ardern, the now Prime Minister of New Zealand. He was a four-time cabinet minister, an MP for Auckland. He stood down to run for mayor. A non-executive mayor. You can imagine what he would have done with executive powers. Um, that was the calibre of the individual that went for the job because the job was so important. And because you got somebody with that level of clout in there, and because the council itself had powers, they've been able to drive things forward in Auckland and actually tackle some of the problems that have been outstanding for a long time. So it's the equivalent in Ireland, the exact equivalent would be Mary Lou Macdonald stepping down from the Dáil and running for mayor of Dublin. You know, that's the scale of the role, and that shouldn't surprise you were that to happen, or Leo Varadkar or anyone else uh, of the Dublin TDs deciding to go forward for it because this is a major role. This is an incredibly important role that you're designing and deciding how it's going to work. So it's, it's not an easy job, uh, but it's a vitally important one. And as a, a purely selfish matter, we've gone through this process in Limerick, not, not like this, which would have been fantastic, but just sitting around the committee. But I do get the impression that we're uh, sort of hostage to your decisions. So we've gone for a very maximalist position in, in demanding as much as we possibly can get for Limerick, and, and I'm hoping that you're going to do the same, <laughs> so that it's more likely that we'll actually get that. Uh, because if the mayor of Dublin isn't given the powers, it's going to be hard to give them to the mayor of Limerick. Uh, and I think both cities need them. Uh, and I think the country needs them, because we need a thriving Dublin uh, to have a successful Ireland. Uh, so it's not a case of trying to take powers away from Dublin. It's a case of trying to give powers to Dublin uh, and enable Dublin people to, uh, you know, elect the person who makes the decisions affecting their lives and elect the council uh, to keep a watch on them. That's it, sorry, just, I don't, hope I didn't go over time, I just see the red light there. <laughs> oh. I probably shouldn't have shut down the computer either. Thank you very much.